Hello, everyone. Welcome to this panel. We are going to have four presentations in this cultural and linguistic challenges of metadata creation. We have four presenters today. And the reason to have this is uh, because this is a area that shows more challenges now than ever. And all of our panelists will give their cases and other special observations and also the new actions. We will start with Dr. Sujimoto. So you can, I will stop sharing my screen. You can start now. Okay, so good morning and uh, good afternoon and good evening, whatever. Uh, so the, it's 5 a.m. in Japan. And so I'm still <laughs> not very hard awakened. So let me share my slide. Okay. <clears throat> Just a moment. Well, Dr. Sujimoto will share yeah. his flight. Um, Professor Sujimoto from University yeah. of uh, Tsukuba. <laughs> yes. uh, we call that Zhubo. Zhubo. He has been involved in DCMI since late 1990s, including being the program co-chair with uh, Tom Baker of the first, first ever DCMI conference of DC 2001 held in Japan in 2001. Yes. Yeah, the first one. And he's currently a member of the governing board of DCMI and also the leader, leader of a new DCMI interest group called Core Cultural Metadata uh, Model. You will follow that today after this uh, session, uh, the CCMM, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you very much for your introduction, and um, I will mention about the some of my experiences in the in my research for these five six years. So the um, let me start. So the here I'm showing the some images which cover uh, quite a various type of the cultural entities. So, as you know, the, uh, we have the very historical festivals and um, dance and also the skills. This image shows on um, the paper making skill in Japan and also the fireworks, that's uh, quite a cultural event. And uh, on the, how say, the lower side, we have the animation, games, and big paintings, and the big buildings. And also, this, uh, this is a photograph I took uh, about 10 years ago after the big disaster in Japan. So the, all of these are quite important cultural and or historical recordings, okay? So but, uh, these are quite a big variety. And so the, we, now we have a digital archive, we do archiving in digital forms of these cultural entities. So the, we can roughly classify the digital archiving process. So the digitizing the tangible objects or analog to digital conversion or 3D or the very high resolution scanning 
a conversion from an original bone in this format to an archival format. And on the other hand, we have a big classification, rough classification, a tangible or intangible. And tangible entities can be digitally captured directly. On the other hand, intangible entities, how can we do that? We usually use recordings. And so the, uh, to, to create a digital, uh, to do the digital archive. So like this, uh, the cult we have the quite a variety of cultural entities. So I think cultural entities are not always an object, knowledge, skills, environments to form cultural activities, artworks as an event, performance and environment, etc. So the in this session, in this panel, language is um, one key issue. And the language could be archived, but how can we archive languages? So that there is there is uh, has a worldwide project to archive or to preserve endangered languages, but how can we archive them in digital form? So the rough classification of the cultural entities is that um, from my viewpoint, there are objects and also the experientials. So the, the meaning of experientials is that the things which you can experience, perform or see or listen or something like that. So, and um, on the other hand, I've been involved in a um, project called the Media Art Database, which is funded by the Agency for Cultural Affairs of the Japanese government. And uh, it has the four main areas, manga, the Japanese comics and animations, and video games, computer games, and media art works. These are, these areas, these domains are not well covered by the, I'll say, traditional or conventional museum collections. And uh, in particular, video games is a quite an interactive thing. And media art works, that, is, um, that can be also the interactive and also the event-oriented. Manga, anime, those things. Manga is quite, I'll say, book-oriented and animations. So there are quite a various, I'll say, media to bring the animation content. And that manga is shifting from the printed books to digital books. So like that, the media to bring this content is changing. And that we do need some new concept and the new ideas to create metadata for this. And the artworks may not be a tangible object, but a thing which we can see, read. So the experientials. So this is a kind of my background. And so I'd like to mention about some conceptual, how say, ideas. So on the lower side, we have the, I, I'm showing some, how say, example instances, books or the uh, paintings or the video games or historic site. So on the other hand, we know that what is, uh, Dragon Ball, and what is Harry Potter, what is Mona Lisa, <clears throat> and what is the Super Mario, and what is Historic uh, Castle. So we do have the conceptual instances for each of these. So, and um, in the case of the intangible cultural heritage, we, uh, this is a Guillaume Matsuri Festival, which is very historical festival in Kyoto. And um, so, Every year in the summer, we do have this um, festival. It's an embodied instance. And on the other hand, every year we have that um, festival. So in that sense, we have, we know that as a concept. So the people, local people inherit skills, knowledge, how to organize the 
this festival and how to create this uh, world, which is a quite gorgeous thing. And uh, it's a kind of a moving museum like that. And so this is a Kong dance in Thailand. So people do play this uh, dance on the theater. And also in Japan, we have um, paper making skills, which is inherited from the past to now. So all of these have the embodied and also the conceptual instances. And we do need to know them, that. So this is a very rough classification of the things, uh, the, of the cultural entities. So at the top, I, I want to say that there is a thing. And uh, so under that, we have the real world entity and also the conceptual entity. And the real world entity could be classified into object and experientials. So the, you know, <clears throat> in the case of object, there are perpetual and the ephemeral and some other things, a motion moving or the acting object or something like that. And also the experience, we do see, we see the actions, services, event, and so on. So in the case of the event, we have the cultural event or I'll say uh, man-made or nat natural disasters. So here I show some examples, books, software, paintings, movie films, they could be a perpetual object and uh, fireworks, living object, they are, could be uh, classified into ephemeral object. And on the other hand, craftsmanship, performance, games, ceremony, routines, or disasters, performance, they could be classified as action, service, event, and so on. All of them are the experiences in this rough classification. So, uh, so in this picture, I'd like to ask you th to think about the archiving of theater plays. So what is theater play? How can we archive theater plays? We could archive scenarios or things set on the house stage. And also that we could archive videos of the theater plays, but all of them are the object. But the, but the theater play is, could be, classified into experientials. Okay, so then the, this is the very, I'll say, conceptual scheme of digital archiving. So from the real world, we can directly digital or curate objects. And um, also that we could use recordings of the, I'll say, things and Digitize them and to bring into the digital archives. So, in the case of the intangible cultural heritage, we have to use recordings. So, in the case of the live music, we cannot directly archive live music or live play, but uh, we can archive them from their live, rec how say, live recordings. So, this is quite a simple idea. And using that, um, the rough classification scheme. So the perpetual things could be curated as an original item or just a copy of the original item and ephemeral object have to be archived using the recordings. And these things, actions, services, events, we need to use recordings, okay? And also the uh, okay, I mentioned recordings, but uh, before that, before we record the, for example, the actions or the dance or whatever, uh, those things have to be instantiated from the original, uh, I'll say, con concept or skills or the knowledge. Okay, then we can make the recordings. Okay, so the conceptual entity so for example, the dictionary or encyclopedia or the Wikipedia, all of them could be, I'll say, understood as a 
curated entity of concepts. And then all of them are available on the web. So item centric and content centric. So the, I think the traditional or conventional museums or the libraries or the archives uh, organize very item centric and the metadata standards uh, let's say, built based on that item centric organization. But on the other hand, on the web, we use content to access, to find access and retrieve whatever. So the, this is an example the taken from the Ashra that is a, a Buddhism sculpture. So many things, many concepts are linked and we can access, find and access to the image of the Ashra, the Buddhism statue. Okay, so the item centric and content oriented need to be discussed in the metadata area. So, and also how we can bridge the item centric and content centric. So the, in the traditional or the in conventional, how say institution, how say the organized, conventional way of organizing the, I, those things, we use item based metadata standards. But on the other hand, on the web, we have the linked open data technologies, then how can we bridge these two sides? That is um, one challenge for us. So this is summary. So this, this archiving was started to deserve uh, physical cultural items, but now we have the quite a lot of the bondage of things. And in some case, I, I, I sometimes say that uh, we have the bomb, bomb virtual object. So the, we collect things from the web. So we don't care about if those objects are created from the physical object or are created from the, I'll say this object, they are, in a sense, they are bomb virtual. So the, metadata standards used to describe digital archives cultural entities are still item centric and they're still conventional based on the conventional model. The, we need to new metadata models to cover entities which are not well covered by those standards. So thank you very much. This is then. Thank you very much. And thanks for everyone attending here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now we will have Catherine, him all the way from Australia. Jen uh, Yong, you will run the recording of Catherine. Okay. Yes. So our Next uh, presentation is from Catherine, who is a faculty member in University of South Australia, yeah. where she's the uh, coordinator and the lecturer of multiple courses, including uh, organizing resources, metadata, and information management professional um, practice. And she's also currently the DCMI Education Committee member. Okay, Catherine, go ahead. We couldn't hear. University of South Australia. Yeah, My name is Catherine Barnes and I'm an information management lecturer at University of South Australia. I'm just going to show you today the cultural and lingu linguistic challenges of metadata creation in terms of materials in Indigenous languages and Australian perspective. First acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge that the University of South Australia and the land I speak from today 
is on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. So for thousands of years, the continent, which is now known as Australia, would have sustained a healthy pre-invasion population of Aboriginal peoples, whose lives and cultures were and remain as diverse as the Australian lands and environments. More than 270 Aboriginal languages, including 800 dialects were spoken. Past government policies resulted in loss of land and language. Between 1910 and 1970, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were removed from their families, banned and discouraged from speaking their languages, and many indig Indigenous languages were lost. We call this the Stolen Generations. In 2016, 120 languages of the original 270 were spoken, and 90% considered endangered. Australian Indigenous languages account for 9% of the world's critically or severely endangered languages. The language of the Ghana and Bangala people and the Boendic peoples, the traditional owners of the lands upon which the University of South Australia campuses in Adelaide, Wyala and Mount Gambier are built, were once declared extinct. But now Aboriginal languages are being revitalised and spoken again, where there is a resurgence and continuity of Aboriginal culture and language. We, as metadata specialists, have a role to play in ensuring they are represented in our databases. At the World Summit on Information Society in 2005, signatories committed to local content development, translation and adaption, digital archives and diverse forms of digital and traditional media. 17 years later, we need to honour this commitment. So for some context, a map of Indigenous Australia with the question, whose country am I on? So here we have a map of Indigenous Australia with each of the language groups represented. I'm just going to focus on a small part of the country, the country in which I live. So just for some context here, traditional country has a capital letter. In the words of Professor Mick Dodson, Director of Australian National University Centre for Indigenous Studies, when we talk about traditional country, we mean something beyond the dictionary definition of the word. We might mean homeland or tribal or clan area, and we might mean more than just a place on the map for us. Country is a word for all the values, places, resources, stories, cultural obligations and, and associated with that area and its features. It describes the entirety of our ancestral domains. While they may no longer all be necessarily title holders of the land, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians are still connected to the country of their ancestors and most consider themselves the custodians of caretakers of their land. So you can see here the different countries within our lowercase country of Australia. As a child, I moved between four different countries, all within my own state and country. I was born in Nakanu country and spent my former formative years there. I then moved to Narundjeri country, where I spent my teenage years. I got my first librarian job in Bangala country, uh, working in, in there in a library in Bangala country. I followed this with moving back to Ghana country where I now live and work. However, within kilometres of my house is, is Permamunk country. So as you can see here, we move between countries on a regular basis. The acknowledgement of country I offered at the start of this talk, when you are an Indigenous person from that country, you will do a welcome to country. So um, moving across our country, we need to acknowledge the land that we are upon. Digitising Aboriginal languages and cultures. There are some challenges in digitising Aboriginal language and culture. 
By the very act of absorbing knowledge traditions into a structure, we are breaking down the narrative and storytelling which is weaved into the culture. In the words of Manovic, database and narrative are natural enemies. The database objectifies, commodifies and absorbs into data structures based on assumptions of metadata. And Aboriginal knowledge traditions depend on narrative through storytelling and other shared performances. It's important not to impose Western typology on Indigenous categories. In the words of Benjamin Mabo, the land actually gave birth to our language and language and culture are inseparable. So in the Northern Territory, 30% of the population is Indigenous with 40 Indigenous languages in everyday use, mainly in remote communities. Literacy late rates in English are low as it is often a second, third or fourth language. However, access to resources in Indigenous languages is limited due to the focus on education in English over many years. On this background, in 2011, Charles Darwin University and the Northern Territory Department of Education developed a project for a digital archive of materials developed in language. These materials covered topics such as old time children's stories, pre and post contact histories, books about the environment, hunting, bush medicines, ghost stories, creation stories, and stories of memorable events. This is part of a preservation, but also revitalization of those materials. These resources were designed for audiences ranging from academic researchers to language speakers, and were made available to read online or download freely. This archive was created through a crosswalk between terms used in the Open Language Archives Community, OLAC, which is based on the Dublin Core metadata set, MARC and MODS. This provided consistency with existing library systems. So the structure of the archive required some negotiation. The primary classifications were place and language, despite one community usually including several languages and one language spoken sometimes across several communities. The name authorities involved Aboriginal naming practices, which can be quite complex. Single contributors are known as several names or spellings, which made name authorities challenging. Also, Indigenous person can be known by the traditional name, kinship name, European first name and or surname, the name of the pastoral station they worked on, or a nickname. And in some communities, when an Indigenous person passes away, their name cannot be spoken again. They are given a substitute name. For this reason, many websites or databases containing materials featuring Indigenous persons will have a cultural sensitivity warning. It was ensured that access was open, meaning no resources had secret or sacred knowledge. However, there were negotiations for ownership, copyright, licensing and permission. Also, OCR software does not extend to Australian Indigenous languages meaning ingestion of materials was difficult. The library team experimented with adding custom dictionaries to assist the OCR process by aiding word recognition, but with so many languages to work with and many lacking dictionaries, it was not workable. Unicode versions of special characters used in several languages were added, but this was still challenging for the OCR software. It was an important aspect of the living archive of Aboriginal languages and other resources in Australia that languages are represented accurately. The primary source of controlled vocabulary for the Australian Indigenous languages is Auslang. This provides alphanumeric codes which function as persistent identifiers with a string of changeable texts to allow for differences in name or spelling. As you can see, we have a sensitivity warning here. Um, words and descriptions which may be culturally sensitive. I'm just going to do a search for the language of the area I currently live in, Ghana. Just to show you the complexity and depth of this database. So the language code for Ghana is L3. If we look at the record here, the language provided, um, the reference name is Ghana, uh, the code is L3. However, we have a number of alternate names and synonyms which may be used. 
which is why we have a persistent identifier of the number here. We have comments provided uh, about the language variety for referenced sources and the reference sources, the location of the reference sources, any links to further um, authority headings for languages and people, programs where the language is being revived um, through Adelaide University, current speakers of the language. So this shows the number of speakers. Uh, as we can see here, the speakers have been measured differently over different census and various um, sources. So it is um, quite a, um, a, a, not a very exact art. However, um, in our area, Ghana language, not 2018 to 2019, there are 11 to 50 speakers. We then have documentation um, for known word lists, text collections, grammars, and audiovisual resources up to 2007, and classification from various linguistic surveys from 1966 to 2005. So each year during NAIDOC week, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island communities are invited to contribute their knowledge by tagging items in the National Library of Australia catalogue with their relevant language code from Auslang. So NAIDOC week is National Aborigines and Islanders Day. Um, and they engage Indigenous communities to code the items which are in the National Library of Australia database, which uh, previously were listed as um, Australian Indigenous languages. They did not have the ex exact language code or the exact uh, language listed. Uh, they were all put into you know one bucket. However, now uh, with um, the assistance of staff, First Nations people, and um, on NAIDOC week, um, there is a hope to better rep um, represent the languages in our national database. So the key part about this is for Indigenous persons, language is more than a communication tool. It is their songlines, stories, spirituality, law, culture, identity and connection. It is their knowledge transfer method. And the importance of providing resources in language in our databases cannot be overlooked. There is much work to be done to overcome years of discrimination and language loss and working with communities to acknowledge and represent their language is a priority. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Now we will move on to the next one by Sophie Chen in Jiang Yuk. You will play. The audio for Sophie, right? Right. And Sophie Chen, with you're probably familiar with her. She has been leading a lot of great project. Um, personally, she's the what we call associate uh, associate research fellow at the Institute of History and the Philosophy in Academia Sinica, and also the, has been the executive secretary of a huge center. It's called Academia Sinica Center for Digital Cultures, earliest digital humanities center in Taiwan. Okay, Sophie, go ahead. Hi, I'm Sophie. Hi, I'm Lu Yan. We are together to present to you. Um, today our uh, title will be the Modeling for Intangible Cultural Heritage, a study of the Pudu Rice Universal Salvation of Hungry Ghosts Festival. Okay. And uh, in this panel, we would like to use one of the rituals in Taiwan as a case study to discuss how we model 
the intangible cultural heritage. Based on the UNESCO's definition, the intangible cultural heritage can be regarded as traditions or living expressions inherited from our ancestors and passed on to our descendants as a concrete and practical concept. The intangible cultural heritage contains different types, such as oral traditions, performing arts, social practices, rituals, and so on. Rituals, which reflects humans' religious activities, is exactly among the part of intangible cultural heritage, and those treasures are important factor in maintaining cultural diversity and to improve intercultural dialogue and mutual understanding between different ways of life. Kudu writes referred to universal salvation is a religious ritual that takes place in the seven months of the lunar calendar in the East Asian culture circle. This festival is rooted in cultural traditions of Buddhism and Taoism. The ritual performance is mainly to worship the dead, hungry gods, and ancestors. Therefore, this period is also called as Ghost Month. The fifth day of the seventh month is also known as Zhongyuan Festival or Hungry Ghost Festival. However, the name and the ritual performance might be different between regions and the countries in East Asia. The following case study is focused on the Buddha rites in Taiwan, based on data from the online exhibition Digital Museum of Rural Taiwan. Pudu rites is composed of serial activities, each of them contain many sub-activities in their sequence. The whole ritual event can last for weeks and be regarded as a hierarchical knowledge organization system. In Taiwan, a Pudu rites can be normally classified as four periods, including preparation of sac sacri sacrificial offerings, God inviting process, Pudu worship, and closing the gate of hell. By modeling such a complicated event, how to reuse the existing event-based semantic model to propose an ontological framework for describing the multi-layer event structure of Pudu rites and to reflect the similar ritual events of Pudu rites in the East Asian countries. Before making the modeling design, we have reviewed and mapped the existing commonly used event-based models, such as Event Ontology, CDOC CRM, and Event Vocabularies of the Schema.org. The Q classes in an event-based model for Pudu rights is basically composed of elements as event, place, person, organization, object, process, time, and concept. After the mapping study, CDOC CRM is reused as the model for designing the event-based ontology for Pudu rights for the following reason. First, the model itself is applicable for describing all kinds of cultural heritage. Second, the design of the classes can distinguish an event as higher concept and an event as an actual complete activity or process by an agent. This can refine a cultural event as a differentiable and a hierarchical structure. Third, Property design in CRM includes elements to describe hierarchical and 
sequential relationship between events, activities, and their composed parts, and keeps relational context between them. The proposed model of religious and cultural event is not only applicable for the description of Purdue event, but also reusable for other rituals and events of intangible cultural heritage defined by UNESCO. From the slide, we can see clearly that all the detailed composed part of an entire event can be structured and defined with hierarchical or sequential relationship in between. As a rare example, the entire God inviting process and its sub-activities of the Pudu rites in Chishang Township of the 2020 can be described by a semantical method. The sequence between different ceremonial activities are also becoming a machine-readable data after applying this model of religious and cultural events. Based on the above mentioned example, the model designed for religious and cultural event can be adopted to describe the metadata of a ritual event and its all sub activities of an intangible cultural heritage. In the practical situation, we have observed that during the fieldwork investigation of a ritual event, all the event processes could be recorded by forms of different types, such as photos, audios, or video clips, which might document the same process or a sub-activity of a ritual event. Therefore, how to organize those documented resources is also an important issue to integrate metadata description of an event with its diverse published or non-published document. Therefore, the model of cultural heritage in digital environment, CHDE, which is developed by Professor Sugimoto and his team of the University of Tsukuba in Japan, will be a promising solution to meet the practical research needs from this CHDE model, the cultural heritage will be not only described by a dual form of tangible and intangible heritage, the documented resources will be also distinguished by physical space and digital space. After a preliminary mapping study, the CHDE model can be used in the display and the management of multiple and different types of resources related to a ritual event. For example, a photo of religious assembly of Pudu ceremony held in Baoan Temple in Chishang Township of 2020 is located in the CHDE model showing its structure both in the physical space as an offline resource and the digital space as a URL-based digital document. As a further step, the CHDE model can be integrated with the proposed model of religious and cultural event since the design of CHDE model the class instantiation is defined as the concrete realization of a concept of intangible cultural heritage and also can be mapped to CRM's class as E7 activity. Therefore, the instantiation class can be used as connection point to integrate CHDE with the proposed model of religious and cultural event. And this node 
will then connect metadata description of all its activities of an intangible cultural heritage, which is structured by religious and cultural event. By using the property RDFSC also to link the class instance of CHD's instantiation with the instance of E7 activity in the model for religious and cultural event, metadata of ritual event and its digital resources could be reconciled in a semantic framework. It can not only distinguish between different composed activities of a religious event, but also make a clear distinction between multiple digital records on the same ceremonial activities. By the integration of CHD in model with proposed model for religious and cultural events, Event instances of intangible cultural heritage and their hierarchical ritual processes can be preserved and converted into machine-readable data set. In cultural perspective, the concept of Pudu rites belongs to one of the similar terms of religious and cultural event in East Asia which share the same idea to worship and respect the ghosts, ancestors, and other past lives. To improve the practical reviews of the model, we have extended the CHDE model to describe ex existing concepts in different expressed forms of the similar idea of an intangible cultural heritage, especially by using a scarce vocabulary, which is normally applied to describe the relations between multiple concepts to extend the class as CHD ICH in the CHD model. With this step, it can promote the structure integration of similar intangible cultural heritage concepts, including a religious event or festival in different regions, making clear distinction in between, and demonstrate the regional cultural context of a specific intangible cultural heritage. As a result, the concept of the Pudu rites can be border matched with concept of Zhongyuan festival in Taoism, and close matched to other similar concepts in East Asia country, which are all rooted in the religious tradition of Buddhism. Now we come to a closing remark. In this study, first, we are developing a structural semantic data model to describe the religious and cultural event and make the higher con concept of an event and its composed parts as a hierarchical and sequential framework for recording the entire process of an event and to improve the retrieval in the semantic web. Second, using the class instantiation of CHDE model as node to integrate proposed model for religious and cultural event with CHDE model in order to map the metadata of an entire event and all related documented resources become a retrievable data set and hopefully help researchers to manage the fieldwork data content of intangible cultural heritage. Third, using SCAS vocabulary to extend the usage of CHDE's class for intangible cultural heritage in order to make hierarchical integration of the similar and related concept of different regions ICH. Besides, 
to make distinction in between by different types of relationship, hence to demonstrate the regional and cultural context a relation of a specific intangible cultural heritage. Last, by designing the CRM-based ontology for religious and cultural event, the definition of some reused property elements have been extended or replaced by using more common and accessible properties in the semantic web such as RDF label and RDF type to improve the findability and convenience of information retrieval. The proposed model in this presentation is a preliminary result of our current study. In the future, we wish to make a further development as follows. First, Using the data and all kinds of documented resources from the online exhibition on the Pudu rights in Qishang Township in the Digital Museum of Rural Taiwan as basic materials to implement the proposed model and to be converted as linked data to prove the model design and its reusability. Second, Introducing the FAIR principles into the proposed data model of religious and cultural events to improve the accessibility and reusability of the data on the topic of intangible cultural heritage. Last, completing the entire integrated data model design and formulating the application profile as a guidance for the further reuse. That's all our sharing. Thank, Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you, Sophie, and your coordinate. Now we will have uh, the time to move on to the last presentation by Wei Fan. Dr. Wei Fan is a associate professor at the Sichuan University. He's also Director of the Department of Information Management Technology in Sichuan University. Okay, so go ahead. Hello, everyone. It's my honor to attend this panel about cultural and linguistic challenges of metadata creation. Today, I will give a short talk about the digital archiving challenges in promoting Qiang language visibility. We start with the language. Language is the carrier of the culture, but we not only talk about the language itself, but also include Qiang minorities, cultural heritage, social activities, and other aspects. First, let me briefly introduce the Qiang. Qiang is an ancient ethnic group in Western China, which has over 1,700 years. The ancient Qiang people only have the spoken language, which belong to the Sino-Tibet language family. Due to the lack of writing, many challenges in recording, describing, organizing, and archiving Qiang cultural resources. Many Qiang people live in Sichuan province, which include Beichuanqiang Autonomous County, which is the largest one. Others are Maoxian, Lixian, Songpan, Heishui, and other counties of Upper Tibetan. On the red map, Qiang mainly distributed in light green area around Sichuan. The red area is the main settlement of Qiang minority. Xiang character is a pictograph. In the left picture, it shows the evolution of Xiang character from ancient times to the present. Shi and Qiang culture has always been inseparable. Sheaves are used to pray for blessing in festival and uh, sacrificial activities. 
Chang people always were shepherd. In the middle picture, like Sento in Greek myths, the feature of Chang gods have two long holes, human body and sheep's hoofs. Various sheep sculptures are often seen in Chang's habitation. Wenchuan earthquake in 2008 was a huge disaster which heavily damaged the Chang minority and caused their cultural interruption. May 12, Wenchuan earthquake Richter scale 8.0 killed more than 69,000 people, left more than 17,000 people missing, and injured so many local people. Since 2009, May 12 is a national day for disaster prevention and reduction in China. In this earthquake, some Qiang village has been completely destroyed. Many Qiang people are forced to leave their homeland. In Wenchuan County, reddish village is completely destroyed. In the left picture, the old lady stood on the ruins. The second picture, the old man carried a sheepskin drum who saw the mountain village where he lives for generations like the time. The right corner picture shows the survivors are praying in sacrificial activity. The first picture shows destroyed Beichuan Library. Many valuable archives and materials were buried. Li Chun, she was the former director of Beichuan Library. The survival who was rescued 75 hours after the Wenchuan earthquake. In 2009, Li Chun came to Milan, Italy to attend EFLA conference. She told the dramatic story about complete destruction of the library in Beichuan, which host, hosted some extremely important resources of endangered Qiang minority. When she discovered from illness, she immediately returned to the temporary office to continue collecting and organizing Qiang local literature. Her brief, strong belief and optimistic attitude inspire us. After Wenchuan earthquake, the new Beichuan Glam is built. It is a composite building. It consists with a library, archive, and the full customer museum. The design idea originates from the Qiang village. It has become the cultural center in Beichuan County. Let's focus Qiang archives. 85,000 volumes of county annuals were collected in Beichuan Library. Most were destroyed after Wenchuan earthquake. The existed county annuals mainly were recorded with Chinese characters. The earliest document is Shiquan County annuals. Some annuals have been digitalized to high revolution images. We can access Shiquan County Annual freely from the Asian Books database from the National Library of China with image version for browsing and uh, vectorized version with advanced function such as keyword search. The most uh, of young people now speak Chinese Fewer people have free conversation with Qiang language. In 1990s, National Incenic Affairs Commission proposed the Qiang Nationality Pinyin Script Plan. This plan is presented by 26 Latin letters. The same sounds in Chinese are represented by the same letters and the sound unique to Qiang language are represented by two letters. 
In recent years, some young people have been treated to speak Qiang script. This is Qiang nationality pinyin script table. It can be seen some familiar pronunciation. The collecting and recording platform of China language resources is an important part of the Chinese language resource protection project. The main task is to preserve and manage multimedia data collected by large-scale survey of Chinese dialect and minority language. Use scientific standard and new technology to digitize, storage, sort, analysis, and display of language resources. Chang language involved. On this platform, we can see that inheritors are invited to make live demo and record their pronunciation and related video. Verma is a recent invention from the newer Qiang people. It is a systematic pronunciation and writing scheme, which spread within a certain range. Additionally, on some new social media platform, we can see some Qiang language learning video which are welcome for new learners. Language is also a tool for communication. Sing, dance, festival are required with Qiang language. They together constitute the colorful Qiang intangible cultural heritage. Qiang people has more than 100 ICH project, which include three national level project, 14 provincial level project, 24 municipal level project, and 60 county level project. China has 10 category for intangible cultural heritage. There are four categories related to promote Qiang language visibility. One is folk customers, including festival. The second is traditional music. The third one is traditional drama. The last one is folk literature. Xiang Battle is a great Qiang myth narrative epic with performed by Shibi. It is a China National ICH project in folk literature category. The left picture shows Wang Ziyong, who tells the battle story to folk, who is an identified inheritor of Qiang Battle project. The right picture shows Shibi. Shibi is the most uh, authoritative and knowledgeable person among the Chang people. He is the communicator of people, gods, and ghosts. The monkey head cap is one of the most uh, sacred instruments of the Chang Shibi. Shibi is very fewer. Chang Ship Skin Drum was a religious dance directed by the Shibi. It gradually evolved into a false dance. It's a type of group dance. Chang Multi Voice Folk Song The multi voice folk songs of Chang people are composed of two songs. They sing in Chang language from the perspective of seeing occasions and social function, they can be divided into five categories folk songs, labor songs, white songs, custom songs, and dance songs. Chang Yi reflects the early farming culture, hunting culture, and animistic worship. 
It's a grand festival which integrates belief, history, singing, dancing, and food. Changyi is a China national ICH project in four customer category. It's a happy occasion. Shibi is a key feature and director. Almost uh, Chang people had to attend. Refer to conceptual model in library, archive, and museum field. We propose a data framework. Any suggestion and comments are welcome. In this data framework, language is in the center as basic, which is divided into two types, spoken and written. They both contribute to Qiang culture and memory. In written language branch, county annual archives and intangible cultural heritage project archives are stored in database or files. Folk literature are written by Chinese or Emma scripts. In spoken language branch, Pinyin and Abigator are both used. Spoken language are used in singing, dance, and other performing arts. Chang language set the direct link to the ancient. We take ancient as super type, further dividing into inheritors and common folk. Shibi is a special subtype of inheritors. They all speak Chang language and sing and dance. Agent has a location. We use location to present Chang's main sentiments. Festival such as Chang year integrates above elements and links them together. Above material could contribute documentary. Some details are not be explained here. In the bottom, audio, image, video, database, XML and plain text, structured and unstructured markup language are different file types. Additionally, there are some new digital te technologies to support recording, presenting, such as emerging AR and VR. In summary, there are some language challenges. First, language needs to be recorded with audio and video formats. This is the basic. Language is not isolated, but has rich contents with social activities. Chang language is an important carrier, which combines with songs, dances, and festivals a intangible cultural heritage to full present Qiang culture. From comprehensive view, Qiang cultural information resources need to be multidimensional, semantic enriched, and integrated with various digital recording, presenting, and interacting technologies. This work is part of linked data powered indexing service for cultural heritage open data project which supported by the National Social Science Foundation of China. Thanks for help from Ms. Li Chun and Mr. Tang Cheng. He is currently director of Beichuan Library. Thank you for listening. Today's new Radish Valley is not the beautiful landscape but it perhaps the most uh, optimistic Qiang place in China. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Take a short break, then move on to the next uh, CCMM workshop, which may bring us back to the same questions, especially for the intangible, for the uh, digital archives. So um, if no other question, then we will take a break now and Dr. Sujimoto will be hosting the next workshop. Thank you and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you.